this endo meeting on September 4, 2024. Today's topic is Realm Initialization Control, a proposal that Gal and company at MetaMask are bringing forth to W3C that uh, we have an interest in, uh, particularly Matthew. Um, Gal, please, what is this? <laughs> Right, yeah. So allow me to give you some context, also because this is being recorded. I'm going to repeat some stuff that might be familiar to most of you, but just so that it makes sense. Um, one thing that MetaMask and a lot of other companies are worried about is how um, we want to be able to virtualize a part of the environment in for JavaScript environments, um, specifically the browser sometimes, so that we can apply security at runtime to different DOM or JavaScript APIs. Um, because of how you can escape such virtualization mechanisms by leveraging uh, same origin realms, such as iframes and pop-ups, which also leak powerful capabilities that we try to mitigate using such virtualization. Um, we created Snow, which attempts to solve this solution at user land using JavaScript. Um, and in the long term, we realized that implementing such a solution using JavaScript is really hard and close to impossible. Therefore, we created a W3C, sorry, we created a proposal that we pitched to the YCG um, incubator working with W3C in order to hopefully convince them that maybe we should compose a solution to this problem in the browser level so that it would be implemented in a browser, which would be more secure, more hermetic, and just like more effective for usage. Um, so, as I said, this proposal was accepted to the incubator a while ago, and we are now following the process of trying to um, pitch this to the uh, relevant um, entities. So the proposal is live, and we're working with um, trying to convince the WebKit people as well as Mozilla people um, to have a look at it and give us some feedback. So the current state is that there were some important questions that were raised by WebKit people that we want to discuss and also understand what would be the best way to address. Um, so before we jump into the feedback, just a quick overview of the RIC proposal and how we um, what its current state is in terms of like um, the the technicality of the proposal. So basically the idea is that we want to have a JavaScript code to behave as the initializer of same origin realms within the within an, a web application so that we can decide how a same origin realm shapes up when it comes to life. Um, so the idea that we have is perhaps have a new CSP directive that its value would be a um, a link to a remote JavaScript source that the browser would take that resource and load it within every new same origin realms that comes to life. So for example, if I want to mitigate what alert functionality can do in the browser, then I can ask this new CSP directive to fetch a JavaScript resource that mitigates the alert function using JavaScript. And the browser would use that resource by loading it within every new iframe or pop-up, as long as these correspond to the same origin of the top of, um, level application. That is basically what we have in mind and we have encountered some design issues that we should talk about today, as well as some good questions by WebKit people. Um, so I can jump right in unless anyone has any questions so far. Uh, I've got some questions. Um, uh, the 
Uh, each time a page loads, it gets to provide CSP per load, right? Yes. So what if for the same realm, there, um, there are multiple such, you know, there's one CSP load that says before loading anything in this realm, load this thing. And then there's another for the same realm, another CSP load that says before loading anything else in this realm, load this other thing. Uh, mm -hmm. How do these things, how do these directives compose? The relation right. CSP doesn't uh, go that way. It's the opposite. You can have uh, multiple uh, realms created under the same CSP directive. You cannot have a single uh, realm created with multiple CSPs. So basically you have the top level page that has a CSP attached oh, oh, to it. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I didn't mean, I, I, yes, I, I misspoke, uh, tremendously confusing. Um, each load of creates a realm but I, I, what I meant was origin. But the, the CSP directive you have in mind says, for all pages in this origin, load this first. Um, CS, CSP doesn't apply at the origin level. It applies at the document level. So it, it's your top level document, what you but, what, when okay, one would but, consider the application. Um, but, but, the, but the directive that, that you're proposing, unless I misheard it, is one that would apply to other loads of the same origin. Is that no. not correct? No. I, I believe it applies only to the top level document. I mean, it, it is one of the open question, but- uh, the I think I we... could uh, explain this uh, as two separate concerns because the uh, content security policy directive is one thing and it applies to uh, the realm and everything that loads within it. And if within that realm, you create a new iframe, uh, it's not the directive that applies to it, but the directive defines a script that then okay. needs to run inside of every new uh, window, AKA realm okay. uh, so, under so... this content security policy loaded page. Okay, so it's only by spatial containment. I think that's I, the intention. I think we need to clarify. I, I think we need to clarify a little bit of uh, the difference between same origin and uh, and related and about basically about blank uh, realms. Um, CSP, if we're using CSP currently, it only applies to a knife frame or a pop up that you create that doesn't have a document, uh, a separate document attached to it that, that has been fetched as a resource. Mm -hmm. um, you could still have same origin uh, documents loaded that would have their own CSP. Uh, and so there is a question open of how how does that apply there? But in, in, in conceptually, those other documents are also from your origin that you can control the CSP and it's your job to make sure the CSP and the realm uh, header on a uh, directive on that is compatible and doesn't allow you to escape. You you're on, you control the server uh, uh, with, the, with those headers and you have to make sure that if a page can load another iframe with another CSP directive that the CSP will not allow you to escape. So uh, that conceptually that that's possible if using CSP. Um, I, in, in general, even if it's not CSP, I think, um, even if it's not CSP, I think any mechanism that I can imagine is really a mechanism that says any frames that don't have their, any realms or created by frames that don't have their own, uh, rules, here are the rules for it. Uh, and, and I can't imagine a way of uh, saying like, hey, if two uh, resources have their own rules, how are we going to like merge them? Is there an override? Is there like, I'm going to do this one after that? Like this seems too complicated. Uh, it's, it, if you have, in, in my opinion, uh, we shouldn't try to solve that problem and let it to the application and the servers defining those. Uh, to 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 figure out the compatibility between uh, same origin frames that may have different uh, uh, okay. initialization controls. And what and what if the iframe is navigated? So an, 
that is, if the iframe is navigated, then it becomes a question of where is it navigated to? Uh, if it's navigated to a page that doesn't have a resource in its initialization control, the um, the initialization control directive of the parent should apply. So if you navigate okay. to a button, you should apply uh, you should apply the parent's uh, page uh, uh, initialization. Okay. Right, but um, this is this is one part where it gets tricky because of how um, currently of how CSP is designed is that when you reload when you load into an iframe a resource that comes from the same origin, but dictates a different CSP or perhaps dictates no CSP, then the CSP dictated from above isn't going to apply from within it, even though they correspond to the same origin. And in context of the realm is initialization proposal, um, that is a problem because we do want to be able to control those realms. Um, Matthew, yeah, I... at, that, at, that, at that point, you're, you have a frame source directive on the top that can say like, don't load, don't, don't load, don't load these in the first place. Well, there's, not really. There's a frame source how directive. You, how how would you do that for a same origin resource? I. You can do a frame source none. Right, but you, practically that wouldn't really apply for most use cases. I mean, most websites wants to be able to load I, resources. I, I I think at that point it's a question of organizing your uh. It's, it's a question of organizing your origin uh, and, and making sure you have compatible CSP headers. And I believe CSP allows you to, does it only allow you to restrict on origin and uh, it doesn't allow you to restrict further in the path, right? Or does it? Actually, uh, it does. when it comes to network um, directives, it does allow you to, to take it to the uh, path resolution, but I, I'm not is saying there... that... Yeah, I'm not saying that it's impossible. It's definitely possible to implement it correctly, but it's also a matter of, of like practicality. I feel like CSP is a mechanism that can help a lot with a lot of different aspects, and yet it's not well adopted in practice. So if we introduce something that in order to securely integrate it, you need to do stuff that you probably wouldn't, then we might introduce insecurity to the web. Um, I think I don't fully agree with uh, that uh, transitivity not being there uh, being a problem because uh, this is still a good security feature uh, if it requires you to return the CSP header with uh, the specified a realm initialization script uh, for each document that's loaded from your origin. And uh, the way content security policy is often added is not per individual endpoints uh, on the server, but through a filter uh, on uh, some layers that are not that dependent on the functionality. So I think it would still be workable and very good to be honest to have it as a regular content security policy directive that uh, requires you to load it in every uh every new window every new sorry every new document that you're loading yeah i mm -hmm. I, I it's a risk of course but i think it's 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 a it's just a matter of configuring your uh, your origin. Yeah. Um, and if we try to go against the uh, mechanism in which CSP works, we will probably end up being pushed outside of CSP and having to standardize a new header instead of a new directive. Uh, that's gonna be harder. Yeah, there there may be an opening to say like if the document I'm loading doesn't have any um any CSP at all or any uh or maybe not I, I and I don't even see how that, that would work. Like the, the problem is that like if you try exactly what ZB is saying, if you try to change too much how the plumbing of 
CSP already works or those policy uh, things are handled in the, in the browser, you're 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 gonna you're gonna hit too much resistance. No, no, for uh, sure. I, I I didn't plan to go that way. I don't plan to change how CSP works, but I do think that the way CSP works might make this current design of this proposal um, a bit more difficult to push. Um, but I, I guess that's part of the discussion that I'm wondering about. And I see your point. I'm just worried that even though that's true and it's just like, as you, as Matthew says, it's just a matter of configuring your CSP correctly. I mean, it's true, but like it, it doesn't necessarily correspond to reality. I mean, at the end of the day, those websites are going to face this problem either way, even though they need to configure the CSP correctly, they're probably not going to be able to do that. And I wonder if in order to, if there's a way to design this API in such a way that wouldn't, um, wouldn't be shipped less secured due to this CSP behavior. Um, That's I, I think there was some sort of, inheritance between between windows and csp somewhere but maybe i'm misremembering if we can find prior art on that uh i think we're good otherwise i think this is a much uh, better proposal uh if it if it just follows the content security policy even if uh the end user of that needs to uh um, understand how to roll out CSP properly, uh, because let's be honest, this is a fairly niche uh, protection. Uh, and if we uh, if we require some uh, like if we require enough understanding to understand the value of this protection, uh, that requirement probably also covers being able to roll out CSP properly. Yeah, that, I does thought make, about that. That, does, that does make me curious about what is the specific motivation that you guys have for, for wanting to advance this? Right. So for us, it's really a matter how, of like, you know, we have SES and Lava Mode that effectively um, change things in the environment and mitigate a lot of, uh, of capabilities that exist in the, in the environment. So for example, if you remember, we have this feature called scuttling. Yeah. which focus all right cool so scuttling for example um is an interesting feature of like mitigating the environment but if you can create an iframe and then just go into that window of that iframe you're going to be able to reach the capabilities that you try to scuttle on the top level um so if we could take scuttling and ship it through the ric proposal then every new same origin realm that will exist in the web page would be scuttled and then bypassing scuttling via an iframe wouldn't be possible anymore. Um, so effectively, it helps us mitigate completely the, the power of the capabilities that are exposed to code we don't trust within the environment. And that is actually true to a lot of other uses cases outside of MetaMask, but, um, but we can uh, stick to MetaMask today. Matthew, do you want me to talk about scuttling real quick? No, uh, I think I... I'd like to um to get maybe to uh to the concerns that um that have been raised by uh by some of the browsers. Sure. Um because this is this is also a good venue and I, I would really like to be able to talk to that. Um so so part of the process from what I understand is getting uh feedback on uh from browser vendors uh on the on the proposal and uh as one can imagine, uh, some confusion came up because um, when you propose a mechanism that deals with apparent security, uh, the immediate uh, reaction from browser vendors is that um, all code running in the same uh, agent, uh, in the same process basically uh, cannot protect uh, from each other because of, uh, of, of issues like Spectre and meltdown, um, and the, the boundary for protection for the, that is considered the only boundary of security boundary that is considered by browser vendors is the process boundary, 
uh, and cross-origin uh, 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 frames. Um, so this is the, the, the this is a similar issue that was actually hit uh, by the uh, Shadow Realm uh, proposal uh, and how the Shadow Realm proposal had to thread the needle very carefully, uh, talking that the callable binary was an integrity uh, uh, protection, uh, but it didn't try to do anything regarding to, um, uh, to confidentiality. Uh, however, still it had to explain that it allowed uh, further creating further uh, confidentiality protections by leaving uh, the global uh, configurable so that uh, basically timing uh, APIs could be removed uh, if, if needed. Um, and, and so the, the, the Shadow Realm proposal has a, has a huge paragraph on uh, security and different kind of security and what the Shadow Realm uh, API does and doesn't do. And uh, because there had been a lot of discussions around that, of course, another uh, things that was brought up by uh, by the browsers was how does this relate to Shadow Realm? Um, Shadow Realm is not mentioned at all in the explainer. Uh, how does this relate? Um, so I think what we need to answer uh here is it, it, there's a, there's a few different points uh and one is like basically explaining that um uh, sure confidentiality within uh within an agent within the process boundary is actually it's more of an agent cluster but i didn't try to <laughs> go there um the confidentiality within uh within a process um if you have is is really only a concern if you have time, uh, API access to APIs that allows you to measure time, uh, however coarse or not coarse, uh, that is not actually a, a question. But um, if you are in a position to virtualize your environment and remove access to any API allowing you to measure time directly or indirectly, uh, confidentiality then is not. Uh, you can actually create a, a confidentiality protections for code that runs in the same process. Um, mature and suspicious code that run in the same process. Um, so of course, browsers usually don't believe that very much. So um, I threw in an example of, well, Cloudflare workers does exactly that. Um, Cloudflare workers use V8 isolates to run uh, completely different tenants uh, code in the same process because if they weren't using the same process, they would just you know not have the resources, uh, and they they are feeling confident doing that because they tame uh, every uh, API that uh, that allows you to measure time. They have, it's actually the way platform worker works is that they um, they freeze the time uh, in place at any network IO. Uh, so if you have a request coming in and, pro uh, and processing that, your, um, the time that you see is the time of the, the request. Uh, if you make a new request and wait for a response, it updates the time that you see to when the response comes in. And so you only see um, gradual, uh, gradual increment in time uh, when you make network, uh, when you have network activity. Um, it's a really interesting approach, and it actually technically is exactly what we're doing uh, in uh, on chain. Uh, funny enough, like it's it's a very logical thing to do. Um, so Cloudflare is able to do that. So I I, I threw in that example, um, saying the, like it yeah, works. It, yeah, the hardened JavaScript demo. Uh, you know the 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 escape yes. room. Yeah, is, I, I mean doing doing both. I mean they reinforce each other. So just pointing at both, I think, is yeah. I, I, yeah, I, the thing is, it's not a production. Uh, I understand that, but that's why I say both. Or it's not a way they would consider as a production. Uh, no, but, but it reinforces the point. I mean, citing Cloudflare workers as the primary is a fine thing, but I think it reinforces the point is if you show it, if you show the challenge page, because it's an open challenge. I mean, anybody can try to break it. Um, so, 
and then and then of course uh confidentiality is not the only thing uh this feature is 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 protecting against um if you have access to a new realm uh sure you can get information uh from any other realm or or you can but the other thing is that now you have access to powerful capabilities that technically allow you to uh behave as the as the application overall uh you can make requests back to uh, your server um pretending to be the user or the app or pretending to the application aka the user that used the application um and and so now all of a sudden it's not really just confidentiality it's integrity of your system um like i imagine that uh for the metamask case is like oh yeah i'm gonna go and sign and broadcast a uh, transaction uh <laughs> that's probably what you want to avoid <laughs> um so um so those are like it's um explaining that that like the the proposal um solved these issues now they raised also uh the question of uh shadow realm um shadow realm is actually really interesting because it's it's creating an integrity uh boundary um but it allows uh it, it allows virtualization, uh, full virtualization of the environment that's created. Um, and you actually need to virtualize the environment that's created uh, if you want to run multi-tenant code in the same uh, um, in the same agents, different realm but same agents. Um, and you need to go and remove those, um, those timing uh, measurement APIs. Um, the Shadow Realm API actually has difficulties around there uh, because the only way to synchronously uh, modify your uh, the environment running inside a created by the Shadow Realm is uh, Shadow Realm dot evaluate. Uh, Shadow Realm dot evaluate takes a uh, a string that gets evaluated. Um, now, if you put that in the browser, that string is subject to CSP rules. So there is actually discussions on uh, that the Shadow Realm um, uh, sponsors have with uh, HTML on how should CSP apply in, uh, inside Shadow, Shadow Realm. Uh, should Shadow Realms be exempt from unsafe eval uh, if uh, so that they can run whatever they want uh, without having, uh, um, I mean, it, it's not just for the initialization uh, aspect, of course, it's because they actually want to run uh, unsafe code in there. But if you have that also initialization aspect, it's very difficult unless you have unsafe eval or unless you have a uh, a hash of the code that, you, that is your initialization that's authorized by CSP. Um, to go and modify recursively all the Shadow Realm constructors, because that's also a recursive thing that you need to do inside Shadow Realms. Um, and uh, the Realms initialization uh, control proposal here could actually be a simplification of the uh, initialization mechanism that uh, that users of the Shadow Realm API uh, need to do in the context of browsers. Because CSP basically makes their life complicated, maybe CSP can actually make their life easier uh, for uh, for Shadow Realm users in the browser. Right. Um, yeah, I think I agree with all of that. I think we also had some discussion around this um, before. Um, the fact that Shadow Realms are sorry, the RIC proposal is somewhat complementary to the Shadow Realm proposal. Um, I think the, the the questions that the vendors had around these are not invalid. It's just a matter of addressing them in a the proposal. So I think we'll take these conclusions and integrate them into the into the explainer. Um, but for the most part, I think I agree um, with everything you say here. We're talking about both the shadow realm problem and. Right, and then the um, side channeling type of an issue. Um, 
Oh, yeah, I, I, no, I, I, one point that I raised, sorry. Uh, mm -hmm. The existence of Shadow Realm does not, uh, does not disable uh, the ability of an application to create same origin uh, realms through legacy means, so the iframe, uh, for example. And that's the problem. Like, um, what you're trying to do is control uh, the environment created by those legacy realms. And the existence of Shadow Realm does not, uh, is not sufficient to disable that, uh, unless there was a mechanism to fully disable uh, right. other uh, legacy realms, that, that would be fine. Uh, and the, the problem is um, it denying uh, these, um, denying the, the ability to create these legacy realm is not always possible. Um, right. one, maybe sometimes you, you want to be able to create uh, uh, same origin uh, realms, like you need to be able to create iframes maybe um, that you control. Yeah, so we know. <laughs> when, when I when I think about it, to me, the Shadow Realm proposal is great if you take, if you can take code that you don't necessarily trust and you want to be able to integrate it into a confined realm, but then for other use cases, you might want to take code that you don't necessarily trust, but you do want it to be able to run within your realm. Um, and in that case, you need to find a way to mitigate your environment rather than create a mitigated environment. Um, and that difference to me makes a lot of sense in terms of like how both RIC and Shadow Realm are valid proposals that are not necessarily overlapping in functionality. In um, another method of your realm, a legacy realm with access to DOM. Uh, it could be another uh, I same origin also, iframe. Yeah, I agree. That that is also true. Um, also, one question that I have in context of something that you said um, regarding shadow realms, you said something about we should how we should consider um, the RIC proposal to take the realm of the shadow realm into account. Um, so for example, how the script registered via the RIC proposal should also execute within the realm of a, of, of a shadow realm. And um, could you shed some more light on that? Because yeah, I'm I mean, not it, sure that it makes that, sense. That would me. eliminate the need to evaluate strings. Yeah, exactly. That would eliminate the need to evaluate strings when you, uh, as the first thing you do when, um, when you create a shadow realm, if you want to virtualize the environment inside the shadow realm. Got it. Because right now, like the way they say it currently, in order to to make to leverage shadow realms um, and to shape the uh, the inner environment the way you want it, they currently encourage you to use the evaluate um, API in a proposal. Well, it's, it's it's not the they encourage you it's the only it's the only way you have but is it like a use case they refer to that it would make sense that i do the same or is that something they're not thinking about i i don't know if they understand that's uh that's how shadow realms uh because if i say it out of context then like that's why i'm asking if if it has context it would be easier to explain um i, I think, I you think need it's some... enough to yeah sorry I, I uh, think I you need think... to mention that, like uh, yeah. uh, Shadow Realm, the only the only way to uh, virtualize the environment, the goal of Shadow Realm is to be able to virtualize. One of the goal of Shadow Realm is to be able to virtualize the environment within it. The currently the only way to do that is to use uh, to do an evaluate call of a uh, of a, of, a, of a, the string of a script uh, as the first operation after creating the Shadow Realm. Uh, this would provide an alternative that is more that is um, not more compatible, but is easier to integrate with CSP. Right. Yeah, actually, the uh, RIC proposal is a fix for their problem with uh, a CSP that mm, blocks uh, evaluators. That's a good hook. I mean. I would take that into consideration, trying to explain why it's not an overlap. Um, um, I will risk uh, derailing the conversation, so feel free to stop it. But I would like to challenge uh, any connection between uh, the RIC proposal and confidentiality.
I don't think the proposal is opinionated. The, the, the proposed functionality is opinionated on confidentiality. I, I agree. This is an important question, but I do have something else that I wanted to ask in this meeting before that. Um, sorry about that. But um, we are discussing CSP a lot. And one concern that was raised that we aren't currently thinking about is whether CSP is the right mechanism to use for this proposal. Um, yeah. And in my opinion, there are some valid concerns. So um, we thought about these concerns, uh, trying to come up with like uh, security and privacy consideration, which is part of like, when you create a proposal, you need to come up with these things. And we came up with the idea of how in integrating such a proposal would be the first time that an attacker that can um, potentially introduce headers or control headers could leverage those into an XSS, um, which is as far as I'm aware, wasn't possible before, but if the REC proposal passes as is, then an attacker that can control headers could in fact fetch scripts to run within the origin of the realm. Um, and therefore the current design of the proposal might be considered problematic. Um, that's one thing I'm thinking about and I could use some feedback on. Yeah, it, it took me a minute to, um, it took me a minute to noodle on that one. And at first I was like, well, if NetHacker is in position to modify headers, they can probably do more, but actually you're right. Like modifying the response and modifying headers uh, might not be the same uh, level of access. Um, yeah. Um, I, I can come up with some examples to counter that. So the first header you can modify to get an XSS uh, pretty much or an equivalent is the redirect header. You can then do whatever, you can navigate elsewhere. You can uh, no, navigate to- This uh, would allow you to run code within the origin of the application. Redirecting to another origin is not an XSS, it's just code execution. This is okay. for- Yeah, it's, uh, I'm not sure. Anyway, uh, yeah, I was looking into the service worker, uh, but the service worker is an API instead. But I think uh, some of the protections that the service workers introduce uh, should also exist in uh, RIC. So it has to be uh, defining a script that's on a relative path uh, of the same origin that uh, the document is being loaded from. Because uh, if we allow loading it from elsewhere, uh, we're potentially covering uh, someone's uh, business model, uh, <clears throat> Jay Scrambler. Uh, but uh, at the same time, we're, we're opening the proposal to this problem. And uh, serving a static script from the domain should not uh, be a blocker to introducing anything. So I would say uh, this is a good thing to limit. And I'm not sure if it ended up in the proposal, but I remember suggesting this very early on, yeah, even we before we wanted to have a... It. We, we uh, were talking content about security this policy. for a while. Um, I remember thinking about it too. I think that that using first party for this proposal was part of the proposal from the beginning. Um, there were parts where I wanted to not limit it to this extent, but I guess that if we use that in conjunction with the ability to control headers as an attacker, we might be able to mitigate it almost completely. When I talked about this with Yoav, which helps me uh, push this, he was suggesting that even if we allow first party, the, like they still might find a way to reflect JavaScript through a resource provided by the server. But now that I think about it, being able to find these two vulnerabilities is just like quite far-fetched. We would need to require that it's served with the right content type. So if it's served with uh, a content type of text plane or text HTML, we don't run it as JavaScript, and that's that's not news. Yeah. Um, 
it I think it is news. I think there are ways to load JavaScript resources if they don't necessarily have the right MIME type, or maybe that's HTML. Right, but but it, 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 yes, it's, that's it's, a script tag, but uh, yeah. that's that, that's coming from the legacy web, and most of the uh, latest things are making mm -hmm. sure that you can't load text plain as HTML uh, in a reasonably working browser, et cetera. So these things are being mitigated here and there uh, already by the browsers. Yeah. And I believe it should be the case in here as well that it has to be the right content type for JavaScript, otherwise it's an error. Good, yeah, that makes sense. One thing, I, I, I feel like I agree. I do want to talk about the alternative we were thinking about and see what you think about it. But one thing that we thought about is maybe integrate, instead of like a CSP header, um, consider a JavaScript API to do the registration because then it would necessarily mean that in order to register a script, you have to be able to execute code. Um, and then it means that you can't, use this feature to escalate from not executing code to executing code because in order to use it you have to execute code in the first place um, which is an interesting thought i think um, do you have any pushback on using a javascript api yeah i do because that means now you have to have javascript that it runs and predicted that, and that, that means you need to have javascript that runs in an unvirtualized environment so now that, that now you get complexity in understanding which part of your uh, JavaScript runs in a virtualized environment and which part uh, runs in the virtualized environment. Well, but that's always true. There's always JavaScript that needs to be the one virtualizing the environment. Um, well, no, exactly. uh, because you need to define right. it first, right, uh, in this case. And you're defining it with a header, then no JavaScript runs before JavaScript runs. And here before JavaScript that you intend to protect uh, or protect something with runs, you need JavaScript to run. So a properly protected page would necessarily have to check a cookie if it's not set load a splash screen that says, sorry, preparing your environment, uh, please check again and then reload the page and I mean, then start running protected. It's not as bad as that, but you at least to have you at least need to have three steps. You need to have a first script because it needs to run as immediately as, as the page loads. So you need to have the script runs, I don't know, uh, in your head uh, as a synchronous script blocking. Um, that basically has one line saying like, please load this other script immediately blocking uh, so that like anything after me uh, runs in a virtualized environment. That seems like a food game. Uh, also, I don't think the web is going to be looking for the other ways of uh, blocking uh, uh, the scripts loaded in on the page. Uh, could I uh, jump in here for a second? Um, for import maps, um, when they show up in a document after a script type module, they break the page somehow. Uh, so they've already they've already implemented it in such a way that an import map needs to be before any module uh, execution evaluation, right? Um, a similar mechanism could be that if a script that has an attribute that says that's the initializer shows up after any other code, that it basically um, breaks the page somehow. Um, and so if it's broken, you can't use it, right? But that, that's slightly different though. You're talking about a uh, HTML tag um, independent from, it, it's not a JavaScript API being called. It's an oh, yeah, yeah. tag being placed. In, uh, absolutely, uh, absolutely. Yeah, so so at that point, it's, it's using the declarative DOM to to initiate an imperative code in a particular load order where the browser can enforce uh, guarantees that that initializer will not run unless it is the first to to, to be evaluated, regardless of what kind of uh, invocation of evaluation could have happened in the realm, scripts, uh, extensions, uh, it doesn't matter at that point. They have every control to know whether or not anything evaluated. And if the page breaks, 
no harm. Nobody can use it. If it works, then it's initialized properly and um, the security guarantees are there if you did your job right with it, right? Yeah, I, I think a declarative uh, tag in, in the header might be a possibility. Uh, it's not just sort of scripts. It's actually, uh, you can, as far as I remember, you can actually, can you put high frame in the header? Mm. Who what? Can you put high, high frame tags in headers? Uh, I don't think Probably. so. Probably. I, I don't know what? if, I don't know if they initialize sooner yeah. just because they're in the header. Uh, they get, the get thrown Oh, can you have high frame tags in the head? Is that the yeah. question? Yeah, yeah, you can. You can, okay. I, but, I just they, didn't remember because there's some but, weird. But rules. They're not going to show up on the layout. They're going to yeah. be invisible. Yeah. Uh, are Are they going to be invisible, or are they going to be thrown into the body preemptively? Um, I'm not. I'm not sure about the initial document, as in like the HTML provided. But if you yeah. add, if you use JavaScript to add an iframe to the head, it's going to be invisible. Yeah. It's going to remain yeah. in the head. Yeah, uh, I, I, I'm curious how it would be if it's declarative. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I don't know the answer either. So yeah, yeah. And, and the reason I brought it up is that like you need, you would need that uh, you'd need that directive tag to be present before anything that can actually create a, uh, another realm, and that's uh, script tags, that's iframe tags, that's uh, right. That's APIs. Right, but but the point is, once something creates anything that evaluates. That already the, the the browser engine already knows that this happened, and so when your initializer is now hitting the the parser and it's being um, evaluated before it is evaluated, the checks run, and if it breaks, then you your page is broken, and so the iframe before it can't really do anything if your initializer uh, says, okay, you know what, that's not a safe environment. Sorry. Um, so, so the idea is that the initializer is needed and unless the initializer is evaluated because it can be evaluated because nothing else was evaluated before it, uh, then at that, only at that point is the page secure and initialized. Otherwise it doesn't matter who's attacking the page because it's not going to be running secure. Um, not quite. I mean, the the attacker can the attacker can modify. Well, I mean, at that point, you're in position to already to the virtualization that the initialization script does can be replicated by an attacker. Um, but you would have. Um. We don't have a lot of time and I have one more uh, idea uh, what to do with the JavaScript API that you wouldn't like. Uh, because it's possible that, the, I, I didn't fully explore it in my head yet, but it's possible that the, the proposal, if proposed as an API, eliminates the uh, difference between uh, reflected and persisted uh, XSS. Because if you can do any XSS uh, in that browser, you can uh, establish persistence by pointing to uh, the uh, pointing to a script uh, through the JavaScript API and uh, having your one-time thing reflected from the URL uh, persisted for the entire website everywhere the user goes. Oh, 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 because you're imagining in uh, you, right now you're you're supposing that the API uh, works like service worker and it's registered uh, uh, across yeah. loads. I, I I thought that the API proposal was actually just for this particular page load. Okay, so for this particular page load, it would affect uh, every uh, item that opens in a new. Uh, same origin realm within as as a child of the current window. Is that the I case? Assume, uh, I I assume you would also want it to apply immediately for your own uh, page, uh, but I I guess that's not strictly necessary. So uh, what's the hmm. what's the point of having that uh, instead of content security policy? I thought we wanted to switch to a uh, a JavaScript API 
to uh, avoid the problem of this uh, being impossible to inherit. I thought I... Uh, we would be setting it for the top uh, window and it would be inherited for the iframes and windows it opens uh, in the same origin. Um, I got lost there. I mean, what what about the proposal doesn't sit for you? Um, the the part where you have to call the JavaScript API inside of each same origin iframe. Uh, no, you, you don't need to do that. That no. is an API that should be consumed via the top. Okay, so that's that's what I was uh, asking about. Okay, so it's not persistent across the page and across page loads, but it's set for the top window and it gets inherited into iframes and windows that are open from that. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay, so so my idea is not of persistence is not that bad, uh, maybe just a tiny bit. Uh, okay, I have I know we don't have any time left. I have this one last small question, and then we can wrap it up. Um, any thoughts about the meta tag CSP provider? Um. If you're going for meta tag, I don't know if you need to go for uh, CSP meta. Uh, is that the question? No, I mean, I mean, are, are we going to, should we support the R RIC directive using a meta content security policy tag? One thing it's to... good for testing. I mean, people use the meta tag only for testing or uh, if they're desperate. Question yeah. is, does it introduce insecurity in a way? Well, that it, we it does it. because um, it does. and meta tags were not creating code execution. So any any existing um, uh, security product that was filtering uh, script tags or anything like that now would have to understand that they need to filter uh, meta tags as well. Yeah, yeah, that's what I thought. Was just wondering and you about... can you can probably run a script before a meta attack gets interpreted. So we're at time. I'd invite Matthew and Gal and others to uh, make a note in the minutes document about what open questions you want to follow up on at a future meeting. Uh, and we'll try to f find a time to do that. Uh, if you'd like. Um, with that, I'm going to stop the recording for this meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.